Good morning, everyone. We're just going to get things rolling again. So uh, hope you enjoyed your, your break, your coffee, some great snacks. Um, my name is Ted Lindsay, and I'm the new sales yard manager at Conan Nurseries. Uh, three weeks into my tenure, I have become known as the other Ted, and I'm completely good with that. Uh, once again, I would like to welcome you to this fantastic event. And this morning, I have the distinct privilege of introducing Brad Hale. Uh, Brad wears many hats at Kana Nurseries. He's the assistant manager for the Waterdown Sales Yard. He purchases hard goods for all three locations. He uh, provides sales support for both trade and retail customers. Brad has over 35 years of industry experience from sales to marketing and product management. Brad has been with Conan Nurseries for eight years, and he's right here beside me, and he's going to take things over from here. Okay, let's do another draw. So, Ted, do you want to pull the number? 73. 73. Oh. Conveniently located in the front row. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to go back to basics. This is a, a topic that was requested. Um, I know there's going to be stuff on here that you know. Uh, there's going to be stuff on here that you do every single day. And uh, maybe I can suggest a way that might be done a little different. Um, maybe it's a new idea that you can use to teach your crews on how to do some of these things, just in maybe a different way of, of thinking about things. Um, I have absolutely no problem. If anybody has any questions throughout, just throw up your hand and uh, let's address it at the time and we'll uh, move forward. There we go. Now we can move forward. Tree sizing. Um, if you haven't got a caliper, they're very handy. So. Deciduous trees, we, uh, we grade them by caliper and pot size. Uh, caliper is measured usually about this high off the soil line, just above the root flare. Um, it would be kind of unfair to, especially on some of those trees, to measure right at the root line because the tree would be twice as big. Our range trees range in caliper from size from 30 to 100 mils. Uh, anything lower than 30 mils, we're generally going to sell it by height. Uh, anything larger than 100 mils, you probably wouldn't be wanting to putting it on your truck and delivering it. That's really getting into tree spade work. And um, the success rate diminishes with the larger the trees unless you're using tree spades for the big stuff. Uh, pot sizes, our trees can come in anywhere from uh, maybe a one or two gallon, but more commonly a five gallon up to a 45 gallon. Uh, advantages of the pots, of course, is that they're filled with a lightweight potting mix, so they're much lighter in weight than the, uh, the field-grown root balls. There is a, I'm not sure if you saw the Japanese maple in the back of the seasonal house, I think it's a thousand gallon pot. Um, you're going to need a few guys to lift that sucker up. Uh, just a couple common terms people refer to, burlap balls, generally root sizes between uh, 12 to 18 inches. A daisy basket is a small wire basket. A size ranging from 18 to 24 inches, and wire baskets can be uh, 24 inches and up. Uh, 24 to 30 is the most common, but I've seen some four-footers as well, which uh, require a little bit more special handling. So on the conifers, uh, we grade these by height from the ground. Um, we don't typically measure the full height of the leader. We don't measure current year growth. So when we uh, have a tree out here and it's you know six and a half feet tall, we've probably measured it to six feet, and we're not going to count all the new growth at the top. Uh, evergreens typically don't like to be grown in pots. A few exceptions are some of the yews and some of the cedars. But when you get into spruce and pines, you'll rarely see them grown in pots. They're just not happy in pots. They're almost always grown in, in the ground. Of course, we always go back and forth between inches and feet and millimeters and centimeters, and, and uh, it's very confusing. So 
Uh, there's a little chart here that has some of the, the conversions on it. Uh, we also use that flag and take, take the lint to size our trees. So you'll often see on the deciduous trees, uh, usually about halfway up the trunk, a band of uh, lint, usually fairly tight, not without a lot of extra lint hanging off it. And we use those to, to color code for our purpose. Uh, the, longer, the longer pieces are usually used to identify a tree that's been sold or is being moved. So we're going to get a little bit into planting and of course everything starts in the soil. Understanding what your soil conditions are like is crucial to making sure your tree is going to survive. Uh, happy roots, happy plants. Most of us uh, have the fortunate experience of living in clay soil. So the holes are very uh, nice to dig and the roots have no real place to go. Big problem with soil is it's very, very fine particles. They compact very easily. Uh, they hold a ton of water, which also prevents uh, airflow through the soil, air circulation in the soil. So the best way we can amend clay soil is with compost. Um, there's a lot of, if you go back, you know, if you were trained by someone who grew up doing this during the 50s, uh, peat moss was king. I'm not a big fan of peat moss. I've been a lot of years in this industry uh, as a soil product manager, and let me tell you, compost is absolutely the best way to go um, for amending basically any kind of soil. Sandy soils uh, have very high drainage, very poor nutrient retention. Best way to fix those is going to be compost. So if you're doing anybody down on the lake shore or you got little pockets of sand on your properties, uh, adding compost is the way to go. And the clay soils, uh, air percolation uh, helps bring in microorganisms, earthworms. They're all going to come start coming back into the soil. Most of our subdivisions have been, um, you know, scraped off down to the, the clay line and then they sprinkle a little bit of soil, roll out some sod and say, you know, there you go, have luck, good luck. So uh, digging out some of that clay, amending that clay with compost is the way to go. When planting, I recommend digging out the hole and mixing your native soil 50-50 with compost and using that as your backfill. You, then you have your, your root ball which has your generally good soil if it's a pot or uh, natural soil if it's in a root ball, uh, wire basket, field grown stuff. Then you have a transitional soil with your compost and the native soil and then you have your native soil. Gives the plants an opportunity to spread their roots out, to be able to establish a lot quicker and uh, really get going before it hits the clay. Anybody heard this question before? Especially in the clay soils, right? So we'd recommend at least one and a half to two times the width of the pot or the root ball. Um, in poor soils, obviously more is gonna be better. So clay soils, poor drainage, uh, hillsides, anywhere where there's gonna be a little bit more of a wonder how well this is gonna take, make the hole wider. And depth. This is the one that is crucial for the survival of the plant. Uh, I don't know if you know the little um, saying, if you uh, plant it low, it won't grow. Plant it high, it'll reach the sky. Most people, I've seen a lot of people planting things far too low. Uh, water tends to collect around the trunk and long-term survival of the tree is uh, affected of that. So the depth of the hole should be the size of the pot or the root ball with uh, keeping the flare above the ground and so for a large tree, you should be looking at about two to four inches above grade. So you should be sloping away from the trunk and above the natural grade of the soil. And again, in wet locations, plant higher. Yes. Uh, just more of a comment. I've, we've been finding where you can even add it, bumping up even a couple inches above so you actually see the root ball above the ground because we know that plants are going to want mulch and different things. So again, I think if you just do it as a picture, and then the next couple of years, right, two, three, four year, inches of mulch on it, and then all of a sudden, it's buried up and around the trunk again. Yeah. So I, I think it's nice that sometimes that can root ball, you know, even a couple inches above the ground. Yeah, for sure, especially for, for trees. And everything settles, right? So we dig a hole and everything's going to settle. So what the, at the end of the day, if you're not above grade when you left that plant there within a year or two, it'll probably be below grade. Have a well in there is going to collect all kinds of extra water. Uh, yes, yeah. So 
If you look at, say, the existing line of soil in the pot or on the, uh, on the root ball, that's where you want to have that above the grade. Yes, uh, absolutely. And, you know, our plants come from, from many locations. We, you know, we grow a lot of stuff here. We, brought, we bring in small plants and, and, you know, grow them for years. Uh, but we also, because of the variety of plants that we sell, the huge variety of plants we sell, we can't grow everything. So we're dealing with other nurseries all across North America. So uh, everybody has their own techniques. Everybody's growing in their own conditions. I mean, a lot of our stuff comes from Oregon and, and Tennessee, so necessarily the conditions aren't necessarily the same, and they're also not planting these plants for long-term survival of the tree. They're planting them for, you know, a couple of years, get them established, dig them up, and, and then uh, and sell them off. So yes, it's important to understand where the flare is and, and where that line is supposed to be on the tree. Uh, plant some pots. So always tap around the pot. It doesn't matter if it's a little tiny pot or a big pot. If you want to get that pot off. It makes it way easier to tap around the sides, tap the bottom, and the plant will generally, uh, the pot will slide off uh, quite easily after that. Uh, position your plant so you have your height. This is where you're going to make sure you have the, the right depth of the plant in the hole. And back fill it by about a half with your compost soil mix. Tamp it down. You can add a little bit of water and fertilizer at this point because if you wait until the end, then it's going to be harder for that to percolate down into the, where the root zone is going to be growing. Uh, so once you've got it all done, water fertilized, backfill the remainder of the hole, make your, uh, your plant the right height, slope it away slightly, uh, and then you can uh, tamp it, water, and fertilize it again. And then, of course, stake and mulch as required, and we'll get to a little bit of that in, in a minute. Oh, didn't find the picture for the grow bags. So we have um, a lot more plants are, are grown in these nursery grow bags nowadays. Um, lots of advantages, plastic's expensive, shipping's expensive, so anytime we can reduce the cost of uh, raw materials and, and materials, even the amount of materials, it's going to be something that we can pass on and keep our pricing uh, a little bit lower. So we have a lot of things in these grow bags. They're great, they have handles, they're filled with uh, usually a lightweight potting mix, so they're nice and easy to move uh, in comparison to the field grown stuff that's quite often in clay. So the smaller pots, uh, we've seen some two, three gallon stuff, uh, right up to about maybe 15 or 20 gallon. The smaller things, you can just treat them like a pot. They lay it on the side, take the bag off. Uh, the bag should be full of uh, roots so that the soil all remains tight to the, the plant, and you can plant it as exactly as you would a pot. So for some of the larger ones, though, it's going to be a little more difficult to, um, to take the bag off and keep everything intact. So lay the plant on its side, cut the bottom of the bag off, and place it in your hole at your correct height. You do your half fill with your packing, you're tamping it down, your water and fertilizer. Then you remove the remainder of the bag. You can cut up the side. Sometimes you can just shimmy it off and cut it around the trunk. Uh, but that way you're leaving the roots intact. Anytime you disturb the roots, you're going to be breaking off small root hairs. So if you can avoid that, uh, if you can disturb the root ball the least amount as possible, you're going to have uh, better results with the establishment of that plant. And then finish it off, of course, it's the same way. Uh, fiber pots. You see these occasionally, usually on smaller trees and shrubs. Generally, fiber pots are used with uh, smaller field-grown stuff that is dug up and put into a pot. You'll see evergreens uh, in these. Uh, they're usually quite heavy because they have clay soil in them. The, you don't want to remove the pot. With the clay soils, uh, they tend to fall away from the roots. So they don't hold as good as a lightweight pack, packing mix. So again, cut out the bottom, uh, plant it like you would a bag, fill it up about half full, and then you can cut and remove the remainder of the fiber pot. Uh, technically, they will just decompose in the ground, but the plants, the roots will have a better opportunity to grow faster and get established faster if you remove that pot completely. Burlap balls. Leave the burlap on. Oh my gosh, how many times have I heard people saying that they took the burlap off and all the dirt, dirt fell away? Well, you end up with a bare root stalk and you've just taken probably three months of life off that plant. 
Um, leave the burlap on. You can again find your correct height, back fill it by half. Once you've got it stabilized and packed down a little bit in the hole, then you're gonna remove the string that goes around the trunk and you can peel the burlap back. Uh, back fill it, you can cut off some of the burlap if it's unsightly. I do like to remove the twine. It's usually based on a, it's a, a poly twine, so it's not really gonna decompose. So if you can get as much of the twine out of the ground as possible, that's great. And then you uh, fill it the, the hole and carry on as you would with any of the other plants. Uh, wire baskets, again, you're gonna leave these on. You're gonna leave the burlap on, you're gonna leave the wire baskets on. Uh, the last time we had this event was I think three years ago and we had a gentleman from the University of Guelph, any of you guys that were here, uh, he's done a study on wire baskets and uh, the results are that the plants have absolutely no ill effect from the wire basket being left in the ground. Burlap is gonna disappear within about a year. The wire basket's probably gonna take you know, five to 10 years to decompose or rust away. Uh, not gonna have any negative effect on your, on your plants. Removing the wire baskets, of course, has all kinds of negative effects because, again, you're disturbing the roots, you're pulling away little root hairs, and you're slowing down the development and growth of the plant. Uh, and again, once it's in place, remove the, the rope around the trunk, peel it back, get rid of the string. If, you, uh, have a, if you're planting it high and the, and the wire basket is still showing it visually above the ground, you can either bend that back in or you can use a bolt cutter or something like that to remove some of the basket. But again, once you've got it firmly in place, you've got the right height and you've got it stabilized, then you can kind of peel that all back. Damaged root balls. So it happens. Uh, we pick up our root balls generally with machines. Some of our loaders here are absolutely amazing if you've seen them load your trucks, how they can pick up these uh, pitchforks on the balls and pick them up. But over time, burlap does disintegrate and uh, sometimes they get damaged. So real simple trick on how to fix these up. It's shrink wrap. So that's what we do here. If we find one here, we'll shrink wrap the ball up, uh, holds everything in place until we can move it safely to the job site and you're gonna plant it exactly the same way with the exception is once you've got it firmly in the hole, then you can remove the shrink wrap and everything then remains tight in place and nothing falls apart and your soil and roots don't fall away. So watering, this is something that um, really it's the lack of water or occasionally overwatering is the number one cause of failure of all of our plants, newly planted trees and shrubs. It seems that uh, everybody has an opinion. There certainly is not one way to water plants. Uh, there are certainly some ways that are better than others. As this picture illustrates, this is absolutely my favorite way to tell people how to water newly planted trees. You don't need anything fancy. You don't need a wand. You don't need a sprinkler. You put the hose at the base of the tree with the hose on as a trickle. If the water is running on the surface, then the hose is turned up too much. Water will always follow its path. So if you can get the water going straight down into the ground, it's gonna go straight down and soak that root ball. And what we're looking for is slow, deep watering and to soak the entire root ball. We, if we do that properly, then you're looking at a brand new tree, you're looking at doing that every five to seven days. And I'd say every five days in the, in the hot weather and, and every seven days in cooler weather. You do not need to water more often than that. Um, so many people have come in here and they're telling me they're watering their new plants every single day and these poor plants are waterlogged. The holes, which are mostly in clay, is a clay bowl full of water right underneath the ground and they just keep drowning these poor little plants. So it's either they're watering it with the wand and they're standing there with the wand on full blast and all the water runs away from the surface or they soak it carefully every single day and they drown the poor thing. So, 15 to 20 minutes for a good sized tree is all you need on each tree. I recommend you do it on one side of the tree for maybe 10 minutes, the other side of the tree for 10 minutes, and then you know, the next week when you water, you go the other north and south, the east and west. So you're just kind of moving where the water is going down. Um, and then that's it, it's very easy. I also set my phone because uh, I have a tendency to move on to something else and too many multitasking and I forget to go back. And, so you just set the timer on your phone and 15 minutes, bang, you go back and, and move the hose to the next plant. 
Soaker hoses, there are a ton of different types of soaker hoses. I remember the ones as a kid, the green flat plastic ones that sprayed the water up, used to run through as kids. They deliver actually a fair bit of water. Uh, the newer ones are more sweat hoses. They deliver very, very slow water. So some of these soaker hoses, if you're using a soaker hose, you're planting a, a hedge of cedars and you put a soaker hose in for your customer. Oh yeah, I put it on for 15 minutes every day. So basically they did nothing. You have to put it on for four, five, six hours in order to get enough water down. So what you're talking about is we gotta get the water down this deep. So in 15 minutes isn't gonna do it. Sprinkler systems, most people I talk to about sprinkler systems, uh, they're set up wrong. And if you're planting new trees in a property and they have a sprinkler system, it's very likely their sprinkler system is set up for maintenance watering, not for new tree watering. So take a look at that again. It's a long, slow process, so sprinkler systems should be on for probably a minimum of an hour on new trees uh, in order to get the water down deep enough. That 15 minutes every day is just about the worst way you can water plants. Rain only counts if it's a slow, gentle rain, like an overnight rain or an all-day rain. The thunderstorms that roll through and blast down rain hard for 15 minutes, you go dig a hole in your garden after that rainfall and the water may be gone down about an inch and everything else has run off on the surface and is gone. So every five to seven days for the first month, after that you can back it off to every 10 or 14 days for the remainder of the season. Uh, if you get an overnight rain and long lasting nice soak, full day's rain, then you can skip that week. Uh, but that's usually the only time. Water evergreens, I'm going to mention this again down the road, but evergreens should be watered right up until the late fall. So some years we have a dry fall and these evergreens are going to suffer through the winter because they are exposed, their needles exposed, their moisture is evaporating out of their needles all winter long. And if they're not fully hydrated before they go into the winter, if they're small and newly planted, they don't have a good root size to them yet, uh, that's where we get winter burn. So the best way to prevent winter burn is water just before the ground freezes. And again, it's a slow, deep soak. Yes? Do you continue to water in the winter? No. When the ground's frozen, there's no point. Yeah, but like, you know how we get like saw days that are above zero? The plants are basically shut down. So they're not thinking about water even on a warm day like that. It takes uh, so warmer soil temperatures to get them kind of to, to wake up and be active. So it doesn't really have a big effect if it, you have like a thaw in January to go in, in water. Uh, that's not going to have very much effect. It's going to, the, the biggest effect is going to be watering it in like n late November, early December before the trees have uh, gone to sleep. Tree watering bags are awesome, if in doubt. If you have customers you don't think are going to water, uh, if they have limited access to water, maybe they've got to go take it, fill it up with a bucket. They will take about five to eight hours to drain. The idea is that they drain slow enough that the water will go straight down and soak down to the roots. And so they hold about 20 liters. So most trees, again, if you fill it up every five to seven days for the first month, it's going to be exactly the same as that slow soak on the trickle. And these are, you don't have to leave them there. I mean, how many times have you driven down the this, this side of the street and you see the municipal planting and two years later the tree bags are still there? Leave them there for the first half of the season and then take them back and use them on your next job. You mentioned moats, uh, mulching, and um, moats is a big thing. I am not a fan of building moats. There are certain circumstances where they would be beneficial. Uh, planting on a hillside, I will use one on the bottom side of the low side of the hill to help catch the water. Um, if you have to water with a bucket, if the tree is way, way out the back and you can't reach it with the hose and you're taking a bucket out there, then maybe a moat might be the way to take it if you can't, you're not using a tree watering bag. The reason is with the moats is that they stay there too long and they tend up putting the water in the wrong place. As the tree gets bigger, the roots are expanding and growing out further and further and the moats are in by the trunk. So they're gonna actually hold water to the trunk and deliver the water to the wrong place. The case in this picture, the, the moat's actually too big. And if you fill that moat with water, the root ball is about uh, maybe a foot on each side of the trunk. So fill the moat with water, no water is going to the root ball. 
The other thing with the mulch, a volcano like this, is all the water is going to be running off and filling up the moat. So it is going to be almost impossible to water a tree like this, a newly planted tree, unless you're extremely careful. Maybe you got the hose on a slow trickle right at the, at the trunk of the tree, but this is not going to help the tree. And that much mulch as well, you're actually affecting the ability to have an air exchange through the soil. And, and as we know, roots need oxygen as, just as much as they need water. Wilt proof, everybody knows that wilt proof, call it liquid burlap, spray it on the trees in the fall. It was actually developed for bare root stock to plant in the summer. So it's an anti-transpirant, which means it holds the moisture in the plant that doesn't evaporate out of the leaves as much. So if you're planting in a location that is windy, sunny, uh, you have a limited availability to have access to water, uh, spraying it with wheel proof will help the establishment and growth of that tree. Uh, it can be used, it lasts about two months in the summer, it lasts about four months in the winter. Doesn't mean you need to use it on everything, but certain circumstances, especially if you're warranting your trees, um, it's a lot cheaper than having to go back and replant something. Yes? So in the, in the um, winter, through the winter, it lasts about four months. So that pretty much is going to cover our winter. If you're applying it in early December, uh, you shouldn't need to reapply it again. Um, again, if you get plants in really dry, windy locations, it can certainly help. Newly planted trees, because of the limited root zone, uh, limited ability to, to gather as much moisture as it really wants, then it's uh, helpful for that. But outside of that, I, I can't see repeating applications doesn't really serve much purpose. So let's talk a little bit about fertilizer. So uh, just as a refresher, uh, all fertilizers contain three numbers. These are the primary nutrients. We refer to them as NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, easy way to remember is up, down, all around. So the nitrogen is going to provide your leafy growth, your stems. Uh, your phosphorus is going to provide roots, also provides uh, benefit for flowering plants and your potassium is going to be a general plant, uh, helps everything. It increases disease resistance, increase, increases drought resistance, uh, helps the plants use the nitrogen and the phosphorus more effectively, and uh, adds, helps add strength to stems and branches. So what are you going to use to fertilize? So traditionally, uh, we go with something like the root booster. Uh, we sell an awful lot of that. It is a, a very effective product. It actually has the high phosphorus, but it also has rooting hormones, the same uh, chemistry that's in those powders and gels that you use for cuttings. So what that does is that helps trigger the plant to grow uh, the very fine root hairs, which are the ones that do all the really heavy work on the plant, and that helps stimulate the growth of those. Uh, a little bit more traditional is the 10, uh, 5210 water soluble fertilizer. Water solubles are very fast acting, so that and lots of phosphorus, so that'll give them a, a big boost when planting. Um, something that only a few people really do, and I and I'm surprised that the fertilizer companies, a lot of them haven't even picked up on this, but we sell a 102510 from Nutrite that is sold as a starter fertilizer for seed and sod. If you don't have water with you, you're not bringing water in your truck and you can't mix up a, a liquid fertilizer like a root booster or water soluble, you can use a dry product and throw it in the hole while you're planting. And that's going to add the same benefits. It might not release quite as quickly because you're going to need the water to, to break it down. But it gives you the opportunity to fertilize where maybe you didn't have another option before. Um, and if there's anybody out there still thinking that bone meal is a starter fertilizer, I'm going to tell you right now, it is way too slow to do anything to help get a plant through its transplanting shock. Uh, helps promote root growth, sure. If you want to throw it in the bottom of the hole while you're planting, sure, that's fine. But if, to use it as a starter fertilizer to get those plants over the hump and get them established, it's not really what it's for.
So now we have some more, uh, a little bit newer technology. And I say new because it's been developed fairly recently in the marketplace. But mycorrhizae fungus has been around as long as plants have been around. So these are naturally occurring funguses that are in the soil. They attach to the roots of the plant and they send out their own fibrous network to go gather moisture and nutrients and give it to the plant. These, uh, it's a win-win situation. They, the fungus gathers water and nutrients, gives it to the plant. The plant has extra carbohydrate, carbohydrates that it gives back to the, the fungus. So it creates, that gives that plant a competitive advantage in the landscape. It does occur naturally. It determines the composition of forests. Uh, it's in everybody's soil. Unfortunately, what's happened is because the way we treat our soil, the way we treat our subdivisions, we scrape away all the organic matter, we've disturbed the soil, we've pretty much reduced and removed all the mycorrhizae fungus that was there naturally. So along comes a bunch of scientists, including one that used to work here, and they developed ways to be able to uh, commercially reproduce the fungus spores. So really what we're doing is providing spores that you can put in the hole when you're planting, those spores, when activated with water and temperature, will wake up, they'll find the plants, they go out and do their thing. As you know, fungus is extremely fast growing. You've, you've seen those mushrooms pop up in backyards overnight, and it looks like there's like been an alien invasion overnight. They just grow so incredibly quickly. The fungus grows throughout the course of the year. Um, it is extremely fine finer than root hair, so it can get into the clay, it can get into cracks and crevices where uh, roots wouldn't otherwise maybe venture. And uh, it really increases the catchment area of the plant by six or seven times. Uh, apparently the oldest tree in Ontario is a white cedar that's growing off the side of a cliff on the Niagara Escarpment in basically no soil. And that plant is supported by mycorrhizae. That's an excellent question, and let's go right to that. Um, did you read ahead? So we have, basically we sell two. Mike was the one that was developed originally, and probably everybody has been familiar with, with Mike. Um, Mike is a granular product. Uh, we don't sell that. So the one that we feature the most uh, and push the most is a product called Root Rescue. Uh, root Rescue is a wettable powder, so it's not soluble, but you do mix it up in water. Uh, it can be used while you plant, when you plant, while you're black filling. As I said in the planting instructions, fertilize. This is the opportunity to mix it up in a watering can and pour it into the soil. Uh, companies are going, some companies are doing, you know, some of the large uh, contracts for tree planting for the municipalities. They're doing, going down the streets, they're planting all the trees. They're coming back later with a separate truck in doing injections. Uh, quite often the municipalities and cities are, are requiring uh, mycorrhizae to be applied as part of the planting service. The advantage of the liquid uh, solution is that you can also use this on established trees because you can get it down into the soil. So obviously you gotta get it down to the roots, but you can spray it over the soil, you can create some little holes and pour it into the soil and then water it in. So if you've got a customer with a tree that's in really lousy soil, that tree is, is suffering, you think it should be doing a lot better, then an application of root rescue might be just the thing that'll turn that trick and, and get that tree to respond and, and give it the resources that it's gonna need to grow. The other product that we have is uh, Mother Nurture. It was created by Braun Nursery. It's a granular product. Um, so with a granular product, you don't need to carry the water in your truck, but you do really need to apply this while you're planting. So again, at that stage where you put your half your soil back in, you firm it up, firm up your tree, then you can throw in the granular product and just sprinkle it around in the hole before you continue to, to backfill from there. Now, mycorrhizae dies every year, but what it does do is it leaves its fungus spores in the ground so that the next spring, the fungus will wake up with the temperature, with the moisture, it'll go back and it'll find the plant again and it'll start the whole process all over again. So it does a couple things. One, it basically lasts forever if that plant is undisturbed. Um, and it also um, does something else too, other good stuff. But so it regrows every year and lasts forever. 
is basically what it comes down to. Even if you put micro, mycorrhizae down in a fall planting at late in the season, it'll just sit there dormant until the spring and then the soil temperature will warm it up and it'll start to become active and, and move on again. But I don't know, these, these pictures are pretty cool. There's that stuff root here. That's how small the fibrous is. Yes? It dies off every winter and produces spores. Most of the fungus does, all does that. Mushrooms, they all die in the winter and produce spores to regrow the next year. We could do a whole topic on this. And in fact, a couple of years ago, we did have Bob Reeves, who developed Root Rescue, come in and talk. And, and we certainly can have him come at a, at a future talk. Um, we can put you in touch with him. He's got a great web website with all kinds of technical information. And we've got some pamphlets and stuff here on, on the Root Rescue as well. So. I'm just kind of hitting the high points, and uh, I mean, Bob can spend a whole day on root rescue. Hi. So there's a few plants that it says on the label. I think it doesn't work on pine. So the, the, the difference is that um, root rescue has 18 varieties of fungus, mycorrhizae fungus in the package. It works on just about every kind of plant with the exception of acid-loving plants, things like blueberries, azaleas, rhododendrons. They, there is mycorrhizae for those plants, but nobody has been able to commercially develop them at this point. Um, so certain mycorrhizae, different types, uh, will colonize on different types of plants. So I think pine and hemlock, uh, there's a couple of ones on the mother nurture that'll say it's not a, uh, effective for, but it's only uh, a handful of, of plants. Okay, we'll move on to staking. I think I have to uh, pick up the pace here a bit. Um, don't overstake. So again, anybody who's been in this business for a long, long time and was taught by someone who has been around even longer, they probably were taught you have to stake everything. And you know, 30, 40 years ago, almost all the trees we planted were bare root trees and did need to be staked. But uh, things have changed. We're barely, we don't really do bare root anymore. Uh, staking can actually be detrimental to the tree. So if you're staking a tree that doesn't need to be staked, what you're going to do is actually weaken the roots and weaken the trunk. So you need that tree needs to have some movement uh, in order to grow stronger. So you have to evaluate the location. Most of our backyards with fences and closed houses, you don't need to do any staking. Uh, if the tree is top heavy, if it has a very small root ball, uh, or maybe if it's in a high traffic area, you want a stake. So if you think you need a stake because it might be windy, you can put one stake and put it the stake to the windward, uh, the windward side. Uh, if it's really windy, you maybe go with two stakes, windward and leeward side. Um, and then really high traffic area, or maybe you're planting along a street where you're afraid people might grab the tree, then you might go with uh, three stakes evenly spaced all the way around. So stakes, you need about two feet in the ground, and the, and the stakes should come up about halfway up the tree. You do not want to be staking up too high, because really what you're doing is protecting the root ball. Um, tree straps are great. You want to have something that's going to have a little bit of give to it. I've seen people where they build these structures with wood coming up, and then there's wood across, and this thing is just about nailed to it, and this thing's not going to budge. That tree's probably going to snap. Uh, and just so you know, municipalities and public spaces, they rarely will let you use wire. So you have to be looking for some kind of a non-wire version. I think they're afraid of poking people in the eye. Uh, stakes should be removed after one year because you've got enough roots to support the tree. Let the tree grow without the stake on it. So one to two years, get those stakes out of there. Yeah, take them off. Take them off right away. Uh, they're just there for container production to make sure that they're, that they're going to grow straight when they're, when they're started. Uh, they're not going to really provide any strength in the ground once you've moved them. If it does need to be staked, then put a wooden or, or metal stake in the ground. 
Moving plants. Is that where you are? Yep, moving plants. Um, pick up the plant by the pot. I mean, how many times I've seen people pick up the trunk and then the pot falls off. So just pick them up by the plants. Um, use ball carts for, um, for large trees. Uh, quick little segue, we have a whole bunch of ball carts here. Today is a special day and you might have seen it in your emails. Tools are actually all 10% off today and we don't discount tools. So that includes wheelbarrows, that includes ball carts. Um, and I know prices have gone through the roof, but uh, you can get a 10% off on all your tools today. Uh, keep the plants in the shade. When you're taking them off your truck, you're not going to probably plant everything on big job sites. Just make sure they're put in the shade and make sure that plants that aren't planted immediately are watered every day. We water our plants here basically every single day because they're in pots. They dry out quickly. Um, so keep them in the shade, keep them well watered. They'll, they'll respond much better. Uh, loading trucks is another one we could probably have a whole segment on just how to load a truck properly but lay the plants down if they're lying down they can't fall down the large stuff should be strapped so make sure you're carrying straps in your trucks don't crush the foliage um, I've seen amazing trucks loaded with just a ton of cedars on them and they're burlap balls and they are stacking balls on balls and never balls on foliage so you don't want to crush any foliage so you got to be careful on how you're loading tr trees tr on trucks that way and always always tarp I don't care if you're going down to Burlington uh, you should always be in the habit of tarping your trees they cannot take the wind they do not have a good root system they're not full of water they will dry out very quickly and so you're protecting them primarily from the wind burn that you're going to get if moving trees uh, without tarps uh, and carry an extra tarp in your truck. Um, you know, sometimes the trucks with the roller ones are going to come to the back of the truck, but your tree's hanging out an extra 10 or 15 feet out the back. So carry extra tarps, and uh, you need red flags on your long loads. Uh, some people have nice enclosed trailers. I've seen some beautiful paint jobs on them. If you're going to a job site, make sure you're leaving those doors open. Make sure you've got some airflow in there, or take the plants out because they can get really hot. So a little bit into maintenance now. Uh, generally it takes two or three years to, to develop a full root system, so watering plants may require two or three years of, of work. So but that being said, established trees rarely need water. I, I really hate to see irrigation systems set up to water established trees and shrubs because they don't need it and you're weakening the tree, you're creating shallow root systems, you're creating more fungus problems and potentially more insect problems by, especially by shallow watering because the roots will then go to the water. The deep watering, slow deep watering is the best. Uh, water at the drip line or just beyond. That's where the feeder roots are. All the water is coming off the tree, so watering in up at the trunk of the tree serves real little purpose. You've got to be watering out further. Uh, and again, I can't reinforce how evergreens should be watered in the fall, particularly if we have a dry fall. If we have a lot of rain through the fall, no problem. Uh, but a dry fall is obviously uh, going to see more incidences of, of wind burn. Uh, a couple years ago, two years ago, I think we had an extremely dry spring. We had basically no rain for April and May. Um, a lot of people don't even think about watering. Hoses aren't even gotten out yet. Sprinkler systems aren't turned on. Um, plants that were planted in the fall the year before, people forgot that they were newly planted trees. So if you're planting in October, November, the following spring, that tree is still a newly planted tree. That year with that dry weather, those trees are leafing out from all the energy they've stored over the winter time, but then there's nothing left in the soil for them to get. There's no water, there's no fertilizer, they can't get nutrients. So keep an eye on that. Hopefully we don't get that repeat again, but if it's a dry spring, then encourage your customers to be watering in, at least by May. Uh, some of the fertilizers. Um, Basically, the two main styles that we would recommend would be a granular, which are long-lasting, and the water-soluble, which are fast-acting. So uh, you don't want to be, um, you don't need both, but you need to follow a, a program. The smaller trees that are actively growing are going to have a much more success rate with fertilizer. Big, big trees, we can rarely have any impact on them. So unless you're doing, you know, uh, drastic root feeding out at the root zone, Large trees aren't really going to have much of an impact. 
there's organic options. Uh, the one thing I forgot to mention about Root Rescue is that it does not like high chemical fertilizers. So if you're using Root Rescue in your garden and your planting, then you should be using organic fertilizers to feed. When to feed? May, June, and October. Fertilizing before May has really no purpose whatsoever. Everything is driven by soil temperatures. Until the soil warms up to 10 to 12 degrees, plants cannot access the nutrients. So middle of May is about the earliest we get that. So fertilize May, fertilize uh, late June, and fertilize Thanksgiving is probably the most important application. The fall, it sets the plant up for the winter. Uh, plants produce uh, chemicals that help them overwinter, like, almost like an antifreeze. And the root zone is the most active, probably from uh, middle of October, early October to middle to late November. That's when the root zone is at its most active, feeding, storing for the, for the winter. So that's basically going to be the most important time to fertilize. Just a couple more. Uh, again, we could probably do a whole session on pruning, so I'm just going to do a few highlights. Uh, when to prune trees and shrubs, winter and early spring is the best time, um, but not if you're a maple tree or a birch tree. And the reason is sap flow. They will leak like crazy if you prune them in the spring. So they should be done in uh, late summer, early fall. And uh, flowering shrubs, again, you don't want to prune them that time of year because if you look at your... Uh, uh, rhododendrons right now, they're all full of buds. Obviously, you don't want to be pruning those buds off. So a lot of those buds were created in the fall uh, for next year. So any of your early flowering, your forsythia, your lilac, your rhododendrons, any of those types of early flowering shrubs, you're going to wait until after the flowers have finished before you prune. Uh, evergreens, uh, pruning the new growth. Candles on evergreens, you cut about a half or a third of the candle back if you're trying to keep a, a little shrub, trying to keep it small and tight and keep it in shape. Um, cedars, you can basically prune them back anytime. They love to be cut, cedars and yews, but don't cut back generally more than a third of your uh, new foliage. And what to prune. So when I look at a tree and I think, okay, what am I gonna prune with this? Obviously the first uh, is broken dead branches and you're gonna cut them back to uh, a terminal branch where they started from so you're not leaving any stumps. Crossed or rubbing branches, I see this all the time. Um, you know, that a, creates a weak spot, it creates an entry point for uh, disease or insects to get in and also creates a weakness where they can break. Then you're gonna look at size and shape and then you're gonna open it up for airflow. So um, particularly if you're doing any fruit trees for customers, you can go, you should be going drastic and hard and cutting them back. You should be able to take a basketball and throw it through the tree and not hit any branches. And um, you know, use the right tool for the job. You know, you see guys, we're using their, their Falcos to cut a branch and they're, um, use the right tool for the job. Keep your tools clean and sharp. It's uh, something you can be looking at right now, of course, is getting everything maintained and cleaned and ready to go. So that's all I got for, for our talk for this morning. Anybody have any more questions? Before you prune it? Probably not until the next year. Leave as much leaf area on it so that it can photosynthesize, create lots of energy. Um, of course, an exception, if you're planting something, it you know, fell over and a branch got broken to the truck, obviously you're gonna clean that up. But for the first year, you don't need to do, shouldn't be doing any um, uh, pruning at all. I have one on the antidesiccant that you were talking about using it in the summertime. Wouldn't that sort of clog up the pores and drain transpiration? Or is nope, it does not at all. It does, it, it allows moisture in, doesn't allow moisture out. Kind of like Gore-Tex for your plant. Uh, no detrimental side effects at all. It's actually a natural plant resin and it will break down naturally and, and just disappear. And it's clear and you won't even notice that it's on there. Yes? So the, the product that I had a picture on there, the uh, root booster, contains rooting hormones. It's probably my, the one that I will recommend the most for planting because 
Uh, as far as speed goes, I don't think there's anything faster to get those fine root hairs developed. So, no, it's, it's kind of an either or. Um, so you don't want to use a chemical fertilizer if you're using mycorrhizae. Uh, and I would say if you have damaged soil and, and you know, you think that the, it doesn't have the best growing conditions, then, then uh, mycorrhizae is certainly a way, an option to go with. But in general planting, I myself use root booster on everything. I use it on annuals, I use it on trees and shrubs. When I do my pots on my deck, uh, I water everything in with, with root booster. And I think that the hormone in there, the, the rooting hormones in there are really what drives that to make it a superior product. Okay, so I have another prize. And because I'm controlling the prizes, I get to pick which one I give out.